Welcome to the Divorce Remix Podcast. Hey, y'all. Welcome to Divorce Remix, the podcast. I am super, super, super excited for today's episode. I'm April Nowlin. I'm your host. I am a divorce recovery and healthy dating coach. And like I always say, divorce is a death, but it's not a death sentence. And so my passion, my goal with this podcast is to bring you guys resources, tips, tools, experts, everyday people to help you create a life you love after divorce. So today, guys, we're going to be talking about something that I think most of us can probably relate to, but we probably haven't really talked about it. And so you guys know me. I love bringing up those topics that's like, April, we don't really talk about this. Well, you know what? It's time to talk about it. So today we're going to be talking about healing after heartbreak. And I know like Valentine's Day is over. Cuffing season just ended. So some of y'all like, April, I need this right now. So hopefully this will be right on time for you guys. So my guests are a couple that I met probably a few years ago. And funny story, I never actually met them. I went to an event with them. They were speakers. And I sat there and I said, you know what? I am going to do something with them one day. Now, here's the thing, y'all. This was before divorce remix. This was before dating remix. This was before any of this. And so I'm super excited to have them on the pack on the podcast. So welcome Kenyon and Takara Martin. Thank Yay. you. <laughs> so happy to have you guys here. So for those people who don't know you guys, and I know a lot of my audience have heard of you guys and they are familiar with you guys, but not everyone knows you. Tell us a little bit about what you guys do. You looked at me for that. So <laughs> of course. I'm the elevator <laughs> That's speech right. person. Um, so we are Kenyon and Takara Martin. We are um, faith-based relationship coaches. Um, we're authors of two books, Covered for mm-hmm. Couples and Journey to Freedom, The Soul Ties Detox. And um, as of 2021, we're award-winning writers of a scripted podcast. So, <laughs> um, and we basically sit based in Atlanta, Georgia, and we have a mission to help people um, really unlearn unhealthy relationship habits and find habits towards healthy love. That's awesome. So that's the, you it's want to so know more? Look, I'm sorry. No, yeah, that's okay. right. <laughs> like, there's that a lot. so needed, so needed. So a lot of times, you know, we see couples like you guys, whether it's on social media or something you guys are doing. And I always like to ask the question, how did you get started? Like, how did you guys get from where this great couple, I'm going to say great job, because when I saw them together, I was like, that's a great couple. But how did you guys get to this place of this is the work that we want to do? Oh, wow. Accident. Yeah. Okay, accident. I'll start. And yeah. then you, yeah, I'm going to tag you in. Um, it was completely by accident. What happened was I was essentially um, his marketer, his producer, his publicist, his whatever. He was someone that, you know, years ago before we even got together, we were married to other people. I had just seen the work that he was doing in terms of like, really, it started out as just him like posting excellent relationship advice on Facebook. Um, And then I was just like, yo, when you're ready to write a book, let me know. Like, I would love to connect with you, help you market. I'll build your website. Like, I was like that person. I'm just like, I root for everybody. So I'm just (laughs) like, if I'm going to work with you, I'm I'm going to literally go hard for you. And so I was just like, let me hook you up. And he was like, cool. And then a few years passed. Like we both went through a divorce um, and he was just like, all right, I'm ready. I'm ready to get this book out. Let's start. And what happened was from a marketing perspective, he started, um, I had him start doing Periscope. So I was like, you can't put out a book and nobody knows who you are. Yeah. So Periscope was this new thing <laughs> back in the day. And so I was just like, you've got to go live on Periscope and do this. So I'm like behind the scenes, feeding him questions, telling him what to say. He was mad at me all the time because I was basically like producing him yeah. and telling him how to be because he's a long-winded Baptist preacher. All right now. And when it came down to it, obviously in between that time, we had gotten married. We just didn't tell people we were together or dating because I was, I wanted to pimp him out, y'all. I was just like, right, I want the ladies up. to flock to him. <laughs> like, he was good looking. He's bald head, got that beard. I was like, let's go ahead and use what the Lord gave you. And mm. I will be behind the scenes. And after a while, <clears throat> once we got married, he was just like, I don't feel comfortable doing this without you by my side. Mm. And he was just like, and what really, well, rewind, what really happened is that um, he got online and had a wedding ring on. 
And all the women were like, wait a minute. What's going on like, now? Uh-uh. No, that's supposed to, God told me that was my husband. What you mean you married? Like, and it was just like, he lost a whole bunch of followers and everything. And what happened was people were like, well, let us meet her. Mm. And they started asking the questions. Well, how did y'all meet? And how did you know she was the one? And how did you know he was the one? And it became kind of like a thing where we started going on together. Mm -hmm. But it was supposed to be temporary. And he was just like, no, I like doing this with you by my side. Like, this is dope. And then it started from us saying we're going to save all the marriages in the world. And we're going to help everyone who's ever had a hard time being married. And all the questions we started getting as a couple were still from broken people. We weren't attracting couples. We weren't attracting happily married people. We were attracting people in various stages of brokenness, whether it was married, single, or what have you. And so that was a shift. That was a pivot in that people started coming to us with questions about that. And we didn't know what to steer them to because we were trying to save marriages. And then we started then really asking God, okay, where do you want us to be? Mm -hmm. And then people started saying, I think I got a soul tie. And then that's where Kenyon came in. (laughs) And so there was a, what we found in our own personal experiences, being married and being divorced and going through all those experiences ourselves with whomever we were with, with the church, we felt like there was a, there was something missing. There was uh, information missing because most of the time divorce is a bad word. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that we certainly champion. We don't champion that, but we do champion being healthy. Mm -hmm. And so what ended up happening was as we were talking about soul ties and we were dismissing the myth and dispelling the myth, we realized that we had to actually talk to the people and not preach at the people. Mm -hmm. And so whatever it was that they labeled their pain, we were willing to meet them at that and then redefine it and show them what was really going on inside them. But at that same time, we realized that there was a, a, an absence in the church Mm -hmm. that there was an absence among, I shouldn't say the church, like as, as a, our community church or whatever, right. but absence in the body mm-hmm. of healthily or in a healthy way addressing, um, addressing soul ties yeah. and addressing divorce. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we or I sort of had to ax the grind at that point mm-hmm. because now I'm like, okay, so we, first of all, we need to get this straight. We need mm-hmm. to get people on a, on, on a path where they don't feel... Um, damaged, hurt. I failed God. Mm-hmm. I felt my family. I felt my tradition. I felt my, I failed my culture. I felt everything. How am I even good enough to even mm-hmm. be married again? Yeah. And so that's really kind of where it just, we just kind of went overboard, started writing and things took off from there. Yeah. I think that's how the Soul Ties Detox was birthed. Um, initially it was us going really hard, Kenyon going really hard about, listen, so times the way that y'all are explaining it is not biblical. And so we found ourselves fighting people about what was in the Bible versus actually compassionately looking at their pain. Mm. And so that's really what happened was, and they were just like, really? Okay. Have you said anything about what is it? Okay. Well, then we just fine. If we gonna keep using it. Right. We trademarked it. And then we started then creating content around it that actually spoke to the hurt. Because when you really look at how God designed us chemically, emotionally, Mm -hmm. everything, it came down to there is still a real need that people have to address everything that they're going through in that brokenness. And it's not just, I'm sad. It's not just, okay, well, you just need to go and pray real long and go fast for a little while and then you're going to be okay. It's actually, like Kenya was saying, it's a lot more of a process of really Unlearning. That's like one of yeah. our biggest things. It's unlearning what even sometimes we were brought up believing about healing and faith and everything. And so we started writing this book almost as a love letter, answering those questions and answering the hearts mm-hmm. of the people who kept coming to us saying, I understand that you're saying this doesn't exist. I understand that my pastor is saying I need to do it this way, but I'm still hurting. Yeah. What do I need to do next? And that's how the basically six week program was birthed. Wow. I love I love that journey for so many reasons. One, love how God just um, we say in our minds, all right, God, you know, I'm gonna just do this little part. And God's like, oh, yeah. if only you knew <clears throat> if only you knew what's about to happen. And just I'm grateful for people like you who 
allowed God to use you? Because it would have been so easy to say, no, we're just, you know, we're gonna, we're just gonna do marketing. We're just gonna stay in this little box, right. but allow God to use you. And then the second thing I love about that is, um, and for those of y'all who know me, y'all gonna be like, April, I can't believe you're saying this. Uh -oh. But you know, challenging the status quo in the faith community. Uh -huh. um, you know, being someone who's been divorced three times, and two of those divorces, I was on staff at churches. And the best advice that I got was, well, pray and go to therapy. And it was like, those are good things, mm -hmm. but what do I do after that? And so listening to you guys, and I didn't, I didn't even know that part of your journey um, and how you felt about that, but listening to you guys, um, that is what gives me motivation is filling that gap in the faith community where we don't talk about life after divorce. We don't have resources, especially in the black and brown community. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you're single, there may be something for you. If you're engaged, there's something for you. If you're married, there's something for you. You get divorced. And it's like crickets. It's, right. it, it's nothing. It's nothing. And so that's why I'm so passionate about the work that I do and it being faith based and reaching those people to let them know that you don't have to live in the shame and the stigma that comes with divorce, especially as Christians. And here's the thing, y'all. After all of these years, I have met so many Christians that have been married two and three and four and sometimes five times yeah. because we were never told you need to get healed. Mm -hmm. And I heard it said like this, just because it doesn't hurt anymore does not mean you're healed. Definitely. And I feel like in the in the church, it's like if you just pray long enough, if you and prayer is good, right? Amen. If you go to church long enough and going to church is good and you don't feel the pain anymore, then you're okay. Mm -hmm. And then we get back into the next relationship, and guess what? We're right back where we started. We started. Exactly. If, if, and I just wanted to chime in because when you talked about challenging the status quo, and this is something that Kenyon talks about a lot, we I think in church, especially with church leaders and church leadership, the goal has always been to keep marriages together no matter what, mm -hmm. at all costs. Mm -hmm. And so when you come to that crossroads of this person is about to walk away from a marriage, I think not many pastors, pastors who haven't been trained and educated in this mm -hmm. way, not many know how to deal with the idea that says, if God is not, or just saying, God's not going to fix this. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's not the saying God can't do it. It's mm -hmm. not saying that he will not do it. It's saying that you have two autonomous individual people mm -hmm. in this relationship yeah. and something is not working or someone is hurting mm -hmm. or someone is being abused and mm -hmm. things like that. And it's like, it's getting church leaders to come to the realization that just because a marriage is ending does not mean that person's purpose is ending. Does not mean oh, that their life is so ending. Good. Absolutely. I think that even step it up a notch, um, it's the idea that marriage as an institution is good. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's sacred, yes, but it is not more precious than the people who make up the marriage. And so when we champion the marriage or the institution over the people, mm -hmm. what we may be doing is not saving a marriage, but creating a prison for somebody. And that's what we don't want to do. Mm -hmm. So we, our focus was really looking at the individuals. Mm -hmm. And when we did coach people through that, we just told them up front, listen, we're not here to save or to, um, well, we, when we coach marriages, because mm -hmm. we did after marriage care as well, but we are not here to save your marriage or to break it up. We're here to help you get healthy enough to make that decision for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's important. And I think that's what, what the faith-based community has been mentioned. Now, now, missing, but you said at least at the very minimum, you were given the option of therapy. Mm -hmm. That has been a no-no in yeah, that wasn't the testimony. church for a long time. <laughs> for a long time, right. You know? No. And so kudos to whoever gave you at least that much. But there's so much more they can give. There's so many more questions they can ask. Mm -hmm. And there's so much more assurance that God isn't done with you even when you're done with this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where people are really hurting. Am I condemned? Am I damned? Did I hurt God mm -hmm. by, by this divorce? Yeah, you probably shouldn't have made the decision in the first place. Listen, That's where, you know, on. you said all these shows or, or all these people who speak to singles and speak mm -hmm. to marriages and speak to uh, dating and all that speaking to them and still there's divorce. All that speaking is really not doing much good. So now how do we speak to the hurting? How do we mm -hmm. speak to this pain? How do we speak to not just you need to be healed, 
but walk them through the steps of how to be healed, how to identify that I'm healed, and how to step back into the opportunity to have an intimate relationship with someone else or intimate connection with someone else and decide and discern whether it's relationship material. Yeah. Oh, that is so good. I, I can just imagine God sometimes when people are standing at the altar and they're being joined with like God and he's going, no, wait, 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 mm -hmm. wait, yes. no, I'm yes. not, I'm not in that. Listen. I'm not in that. Yes. Listen, yes. there was one, we did, we pushed one couple through premarital counseling and we got them through and they were having a baby. So they had already made up mm. their mind that they were getting married. But it was like the one couple where we both sat back and said, we should have told them not to get married. Because within a year and a half, it was hell for the both of them. Mm -hmm. And we knew going in, we knew they should not be married. Mm -hmm. And because once you get people to a place of, of they've already made up their mind, like we're dealing with a, a person right now where he's just like, God already told me this is my wife, right? And he's making all of these permanent decisions without really evaluating if that woman is really for right. him. If that's really the kind of relationship that you want to have for the long haul. Or if God so. even makes those calls. <laughs> God doesn't make those calls. I'm, I'm, I'm completely and thoroughly convinced. Now there we, okay. So we can't say all the time because right. there's always a exception, to an the exception right. to the rule. But the exception to the rule is the exception to the rule, which means that that's a called out thing yeah. that just like Paul being single, that was a called out thing. That was an exception to the rule because he felt like it was better to be single. But the issue is there's a lot of people who are emotionally driven to identify their mate yeah. and then they want to blame God for that emotion that they feel. And really they just jazzed up and it's okay to be jazzed up. Mm -hmm. But have you done your work? Have you done your homework? Have you um, looked into this? Have you discerned it? You hit the nail on the head. So you said emotionally driven. So I do a workshop called Dating Remix. And mm, the goal yes. is to teach people how to date differently, right? Because we know that healthy marriages start with what? Healthy, healthy dating, healthy okay? Dating, yes. And one of the things that I coach to every time is follow the fruit and not your feelings. Listen. Because we get caught up in these emotions, right? But the fruit is saying something different. Right. And so it's, when you said emotionally, that that's spot on, right? Absolutely. Another thing, and I just talked to someone about this today, they were talking about going to counseling, right? So, you know, in the church, we're kind of taught you date for this amount of time sometimes. Mm -hmm. you, then you go to premarital counseling, you get engaged, you go to counseling, then you get married. Okay? Right. So I look at it the opposite now. You date for a little bit of time, you go to counseling first <laughs> before right. you get engaged. Because yes. that'll help you determine, do I need to be engaged at all? Because once you hit that engagement, then all them feelings change, right? Because now it's like, we got to set a date. Well, you got and, a purpose now. Now you're yes. working towards a date and not towards a lifetime. Yes. Right. Yeah. So going back to taking away the emotions out of it, right? We're human. We're going to have emotions. But put some things in place to yes. counteract those emotions and to say, am I really seeing the fruit? Or is this just a feeling that exactly. I have? That exactly. I have? And, it's, and it's not a formula. It's not, um, you know, pray find them at the altar, date for a little bit, go, <laughs> to, go, go do this, <laughs> do that. Do that. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not a form. And, and I think yeah. that's what we're, because it's not enough adequate answers for us, we look for formulas to feel like that this is the right way to go. And it's not Sorry. mechanized like that. Yes. And we have to not, I used to call it lazy dating or mm. I used to call it lazy, but it's not lazy because people are really trying their best. Mm -hmm. They're really trying to give their all but they just don't have the right guidance to understand mm -hmm. how do I discern? Yeah. How do I see? What am I looking for? Fruit. What kind of fruit am I looking for? How far is it falling from a tree? Do I need to see the tree? Because <laughs> the, the tree is right. Check out Listen. the tree. <laughs> Check out the tree. You Turn that into a t-shirt. <laughs> um, you you no, I was just going to say too, when it comes down to emotions, I think, Again, growing up in church, I was raised in the pew. My first marriage was at 19 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and I tell everyone, and it's, you know, even in our Healing After Heartbreak uh, presentation, I was bred to be a bride. Like, that is how I was raised. Like, I was 12 years old in workshops learning how to cut up chicken and learning how to iron and stuff like that because they're teaching how to, us how to be great wives. Mm -hmm. 
And then I turn what? 17, 18. And then all of a sudden the prophesying begins. We're prophesying that you're going to find a husband. We're prophesying that God going to send you this. We pro And so we start looking for miracle signs and wonders. And we take the practicality out of the dating process. And so I went from straight from being a kid um, to being, you know, well, look, I got pregnant too. So I did get married at 19. I got pregnant too. Well, I'm not going <laughs> to lie about that. Um, so like, so it was that too, but it was the idea that I didn't know that there was more for me than just being a wife mm. because I was never taught there was anything more for me than just being a wife. Yeah. And so I think my emotions and I'm feeling so good about this. It must be God. It must be God that sent him to me. And we're going to live happily ever after until I got that first busted lip, yep. right? And so, it, and then you go to the church, this, I have a busted lip, have sex more. Don't talk a whole lot, mm -hmm. so, you know, quiet yourself down and he'll be a better husband to you. And so mm -hmm. all those things have to do with nothing other than me not looking practically at who this person was. Cause right before I got pregnant, God gave me a window. God gave me, and when I started seeing the pattern, I started seeing the insecurity, I started seeing the jealousy. And it was like, even though we had not been engaged yet, I had already made up my mind, this is my husband, because God sent it to me because it felt good all this time that we've mm -hmm. been together. And so that's been the thing that I had to unlearn through my first two marriages. This is my third. So, you know, I had to literally unlearn that God is not about making me feel good when it comes down to dating. God wants me to look in him, search the scriptures, look at what those fruits are. Listen, that that whole love is patient, love is kind. Yes. Don't read that at your wedding day. You need to read it before you start dating and Come see, on. are they not boastful? Are they not rude? Are they patient? Like all mm -hmm. those things before I even get into a marriage. And I didn't do that. Until King and Martin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, but here's the thing. So I'm going to ask you guys this question because I asked this in the dating workshop. Yeah. How did you learn how to date? Oh, so you you you, you talk about height. Well, mm -hmm. initially, like early on in life? Yeah. No, I was never taught how to date. Oh. That, and that's it right there. No. Yes. The, dating I got, the dating advice I got as a young lady was don't get pregnant. Don't. And no, it was my, like. Yes. Oh, okay. that was it. That was it. And clearly I failed. Right. <laughs> Look, my, I, grace of God, okay? <laughs> grace of God. And so I share that because, you know, we, we go into something like dating. I think we take it so lightly, right? Because of what the world shows us on TV and, you know, the, the stupid stuff you do in school and things like that. And so, but we go into it and it's like, wait a minute, you got to get a degree to do all these other things. You got to get training, do all these other things. But the most important decision of our lives, you don't need no training. You don't need no degree. You don't need nothing. You just go and do it. At just least back it. in the day, they used to make you, uh, they used to force you to get like at least a blood test and stuff, right? <laughs> so at least you know the family history right. of what's in your bloodline. And it wasn't your cousin. Yeah, that too. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, funny story Don't. about that. Okay. Um, <laughs> anyway, you are absolutely right. You're so silly. <laughs> so, um, you know, what we've been talking about, I know people can relate to, right? We talked about just how we get into these situations. And so I want to talk about, like, what happens after. So these relationships in, whether it's marriage, um, you were just dating, you were living together regardless, but you have this relationship that ends, and now you, we've got what we call heartbreak, yes. right? So why is it so important to make sure that we are healed after that? So I mentioned before, you know, we'll get to this point where it's like, I don't feel it anymore. I'm not hurting anymore, so I'm okay. But we know that being okay is not good enough. Mm -hmm. But why do we need to be healed from heartbreak? So healing is, is, is very interesting because healing takes, it's more than just about pain. Mm -hmm. Think about breaking, breaking a limb. Not mm -hmm. only do you have to get the limb reset, cast, wait for it to mend, come back together, but then you got to learn how to use it again. Yeah. Mm. And how we used it previously is how we got it broken in the first place. So part of healing is breaking the habits that we had previously mm. in order to make sure that we don't end back up here again. And, 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 and then we can use the strength of the wound that we had previously or the, the wound that we have now. That wound is still useful. That wound is still a testimony. That wound is still a way that we tell our children, hey, listen, I see what's going on here. You don't want to do this. We have 
all three of us, we have this experience mm-hmm. now where we can actually talk to people and tell them from a personal experience, from an educated experience, experience from a professional experience that says, and now we can tell you, you don't want to be doing that. Yeah. You don't want to do that. But healing is that is important in order to become um, intimately responsible, intimately to, to uh, connect intimately with someone else. Coming out of a relationship, we're so hurt. We're testing ourselves. We blame ourselves. Mm-hmm. I failed. Why aren't I good enough? Why, why am I not better than he is or she is? Um, what did I do wrong? Can I get him back? Mm-hmm. Um, now you're grinding your gears, trying to get something going, and you're trying to prove yourself. A lot of people that we've talked to who finally felt good, got to the point of feeling good, jumped straight up out there again to prove themselves mm-hmm. and got dusted yeah, immediately. Listen. And we told them, we said, we, 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 it's a rule of ours. Don't leave us and go date again. Yeah. Don't do it. Well, can I, well, I'm just talking. All right. You do what you want to do, mm-hmm. but I'm, but our, our line is open and we keep our line open a little bit. You know, they could text us mm-hmm. or whatever. They text us. Uh, what do I do? Cause this has happened. And normally it's, they've, and this is usually the thing. It does. It's not just dating again. Many times, the first person that they date after that heartbreak, yes, is yes. somebody from their past. Yep, it's somebody that like either you used to. We used to be together, and now it's like, mm-hmm. oh my god, it's so sweet, we're rekindling. Or mm-hmm. it's someone who's had their eye on you all the way through what you've been through, and just been lurking and waiting to slide in. Mm-hmm. And it's. The a number one thing that people do, and I'm like, do not do that. Or and, and if you're going to go to someone that you've known previously, treat it as an entirely different person because you are not the same and they are not the same. I always, <clears throat> not always, I've started referring to heartbreak as a trauma. People don't treat it like a trauma because the culture will have you go and dance it off, twerk it off, drink Come it on. off, smoke it off. And as long as I can look good during this, I can trick myself into believing, fake it till you make it. I can trick myself Mm -hmm. into believing that I'm okay. But when you experience heartbreak, it is effectively a trauma. Um, And I heard um, a therapist that we follow, her name is Dr. Ayana. And she was just like, listen, a trauma is basically, it's a line of demarcation. How you were before that event and how you are after that event. It doesn't have to be a war. It doesn't have to be something where like, oh my God, like somebody almost killed you or things like that. Your heartbreak has effectively changed you. Yeah. And so now you have to carry on your life about and think about what has changed. Who was I before and who am I today? And govern yourself accordingly if you don't want to end up back where you just came from. Oh, that's so good. Um, I tell people all the time, um, I married the same man three times. He just had a different name mm-hmm. because exactly what you just said was I, I would get to, and, and when you think about it, being divorced every 10 years, I could see the pattern but that the first three years, I'm good. I'm healing. I'm doing all these things. The next three years is me and you got, then I meet somebody. Mm-hmm. And it was the same pattern over and over and over again. And what God showed me about that was, um, he said the, that every experience we have is like a tree growing in the forest of our hearts. Mm. And when you get into these unhealthy relationships, that tree is dying. Well, what happens when you have a tree that's dying is that those roots affect every other tree that's Mm. in that. So that's your financial tree, your career tree, your, you know, that tree is affecting it. And so what God was showing me with me specifically, and I just think it's a word for anyone who's in that, that cycle is that I never pulled up the tree I would cut down the root, I mean, cut down the branches, but Mm -hmm. the tree was still there. Mm. And it wasn't until I went through the painful (laughs) and hard um, process of yanking up the roots that God can say, okay, now I can plant something new here. And so without doing that, we just repeat those patterns over and over and over again. It's so funny. Um, In the, the book, The Soul Ties Detox, we have them go through an exercise where it's like, take a look at this relationship. How has it impacted you emotionally? How has it impacted you financially? How has it impacted yep. you spiritually? And the goal of that exercise is once you get to the very end of everything and you see one person 
and and our own habits. We can't just blame it on them. We're right, gonna right. we're gonna stop that in Jesus' name. Mm-hmm. Um, this whole experience has effectively completely messed up your whole life. Mm-hmm. And is this the fruit that you want to keep um, growing? What's the producing? Mm-hmm. Um, if you stay in this healthy, unhealthy relationship or continue to stay in these types of unhealthy relationships, mm-hmm. this is the result. Now you've got documented proof. You can't hide it anymore. It's there. Girl, I heard <laughs> is one of my favorite sayings. Documentation beats conversation. That's it. Because it's so easy for us to forget. Yep. It's almost like, and you can relate to this, how they say, you know, when you're in labor, you like, I'm never doing this again. Mm-hmm. But then a year later, you're looking at that cute little baby and you're thinking, you know what? Maybe I'll have nothing. Now, I didn't. I only have one. Yeah. <laughs> well, but my not. sister got four. I, look, but it's kind of that same thing, right? Where it's like you forget mm-hmm. that pain once you feel like things are going well. And so I love, I do a similar exercise, but I love having them actually write it out. Yes. And what I tell them to do is when you get into the next relationship, pull that out. And I want you to look, look, is this happening? Is this happening? Is my behavior changing? You know, what are the things I see? Is my character changing? So that you have something tangible to actually look at and you have data. Right. And you you tell them you have them do this while they're dating? I have them do this like when they meet somebody. So I have have something called evaluation. And it starts on the first phone call from the first date to so many months in. So literally from the first phone call, you need to take out this, answer these questions. From the first date, answer these questions because you don't want to get so far in your feelings. Uh-huh. And now I didn't forgot all the other stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's it. All of a sudden, oh God, I think he's the one. But did you look at the data? <laughs> yes, yes. And I think that's where we miss it when we break up. Like you said, we go out, we hit the streets, we with our friends. Take some time and evaluate what actually happened in that relationship and whose fault was it. So. Yeah. When I started dating again, I started dating again about 2021, and I felt like God was like, okay, you can, you know, kind of get out there. Oh, that and sounds fun. It, it, oh, Jesus. And so, <laughs> praise, praise the Lord. And so, uh, uh, one thing that I did, I reached out to two of my exes from about 20 years ago. Now, these are people I trust their opinion. Okay, so um, if y'all are listening and y'all are like, I'm about to reach out to my exes, hold on, pump the brakes. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. So, these were two people that I, I felt um, safe with speaking with. So there was no rekindling. There was none of that. And I asked them, I said, you know, why did we break up? Both of them said the exact, now they don't don't know each other. Both said the exact same thing. They said, April, you were mean. And I was like, you were right. Well, because I had seen so many unhealthy relationships that I honestly felt like men didn't have feelings. And so I was that woman. I'm going to tell you my mind. I'm going to, because if if you're hurting me, there's no way you have feelings. And so I was mean. And so Said all that to say that sometimes we have to go back and take ownership of our part in some of these relationships, right? And so I had to re unlearn, rethink, retrain myself to wait a minute. People do have feelings. And what am I saying? What is my character saying? You know, when I'm interacting. And so said all that to say that we do have to take some ownership sometimes in these relationships. Absolutely. We can't just blame the other person. <laughs> Absolutely. We got to heal from ourselves. Yes. And that's, that's another part of healing. Yeah. And I don't think um, a lot of people really delve into that because we uh especially as christians have victim mentalities now i'm not saying that there are no victims right but by claiming 100 percent victim mentality like i was you know mm-hmm. like say someone was cheated on we get it you're the mm-hmm. victim in that yeah. you were hurting that we understand you mm-hmm. what got you there what did you miss? What red flags did you mm-hmm. miss? What were you actually looking, you know, mm-hmm. things like, or what kind, what were you looking for? Yeah. Were you, was he just fly, that fly, you know, was he, what, was he everything you needed and you didn't care about anything else mm-hmm. until you got in too deep when you couldn't handle it? Mm-hmm. Or were you trying to go out there and play with the boys because you felt like you could do whatever they do? It's all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Men do this too, but we got to heal from ourselves as well. So yeah. that's a good point. Yeah. We stunt our growth. Mm-hmm. when we don't give ourselves the opportunity um, to be introspective about our choices, mm-hmm. about our decisions. Um, I think it's really profound. I it was I, I keep repeating this. I was talking to my daughter the other day and she's dating. She's, she's about to be 20. <laughs> and so I'm just like, okay, so do we like him? Like, and so me and my kids, we have very open and candid mm-hmm. conversations. I'm like, do we like him? She was just like, I think I like him, but... Um, I need to evaluate more because 
I'm not sure if I like him because I like him or if I, or if I like him because he gives me the attention that I want right now. And so her past two boyfriends, one was scarce. He was pre-med. And so he was never involved in talking to her. The other one wanted to talk all the time. So there was no medium. And so she was like, this guy is a great medium. And I said, it's funny. Sometimes we gravitate towards something we've never had before. And many of us are too quick to turn it into a relationship before evaluating why am I attracted to this person and she like i mean 19 years old i was just like well you can just go ahead and shame me right <laughs> right okay i was like because i wasn't thinking like that at 19 oh, i was pregnant and married mm. like that was it and so it was like when you're dating people have the wisdom to take a step back and look at that person go through april's list and her questions and say why yeah. am i dating this person yeah you know yeah is it because I want someone who's going to compliment me or someone that I need. I'm trying to fill a need. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to fill a void. A right? void. And yeah. so asking yourself, is that why I'm dating this person? Mm -hmm. Or like, my life is good and they're complimenting what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. exactly. So I want to dig into one more thing because this is good. Like y'all, we can talk I know, for we can hours, be all day, all day. hours, but I'm not going to let y'all give all that away for free. So <laughs> I want to talk about disconnecting from toxic people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a big one. We get sometimes into these relationships with people who are unhealthy for us. And for some reason, we kind of feel like, like, I just can't, you know, break away. Or I just can't give them up. But why is it important for us to make sure we're disconnecting from those people that are toxic to us? Um, because it's addictive. It's, it's an addiction behavior. Um, the... Just like the car alluded to earlier, uh, biologically, biochemically, they jazz us up. They get us together. They they make us feel good. We are literally changing inside neurologically because of them. And because of that, um, we may not like what they do to us, but we can't seem to let go of it. And that is an addiction type behavior. And so in order to to at least make a clear cut decision, you got to take a break from them. We, even though it's, we're talking about toxic people, even in marriages, we suggest a work in separation. Not a separation where you're planning on getting a divorce and y'all not going to go date, but a time, a time to get away from each other so that you can detox from each other, stop hurting each other, and then make good decisions about each other. And we can't do that in the midst of being next to someone who's toxic. It's like um, the fire. It's like yeah, yeah, <laughs> just like I was about to say the fire or or um, carbon monoxide. It's like just being in a space. You can't escape a fire and still be amongst the smoke. Mm -hmm. You can't. That's not how you live. As a matter of fact, it's the smoke that kills you usually first, okay. then the fire later. So we have to actually protect ourselves from what we believe may is hurting. Just identify if it's hurting and then move away. Give yourself some time. They're not going to go nowhere. And if they do go somewhere, you can't hit clue, clue. So we have to actually get away from that. We have to move down the line from that. Yeah. Um, and just to piggyback off of that, I would say a lot of times when we're in toxic relationships, especially over a period, over a period of time. And it doesn't matter if it's an intimate partner or if it's familial or if it's friends or if it's your job. Um, a lot of times we're in that environment for so long, we've sat there and allowed their toxicity to lie to us about who we are. And over time, we've begun to believe it. And as long as we're in an environment with people who are lying to us about our worth, our value, about what we're supposed to be, about what we deserve, we're never going to truly be able to introduce ourselves to environments that actually feed us and nourish us. And so, you know, we talk to clients, one of the first things we have them do is cut off all connection. And that's social media, that's, you know, um, text messaging, anything. Because even, even if you move yourself from the environment itself, if they still have access to you, they still have an influence over you. And so it's establishing healthy boundaries to make sure that unhealthy people do not have access. Now, establishing healthy boundaries is hard for somebody, especially who's coming out of abuse. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do that when I've allowed this person to run my life. But that's what therapy is for. That's what coaches is for, are for. 
And so you have to make sure that you're putting yourself in an environment that says, I am safe here. I'm safe to evolve here. I'm safe to heal here without the influence of anyone who's going to deter my healing for their purpose as yeah. opposed to what's for me. Yeah, that is so good. Oh, man, that's so good. Um, the vision that I get when I think about being in the vicinity of those people that have hurt us, right? I get this vision of like a foggy mirror. So you get out the bathroom, the, the mirror's foggy, right? You can see the outline of mm. yourself, but it's foggy. So you yeah. can only see so much. That's and it's good. not until you take the time to clear that fog away that you actually see who you are. So until then, you just got this distorted view of who you are. That's so good. that's so good. That separates separation. People don't understand how important it is to separate from those things that are hurting you. Mm -hmm. Not just I'm going to talk to them a little bit less, but to separate from it. Y'all, let me that's tell it. you something. <laughs> this has been good. <laughs> this has been really? so, so good. Thank yes, you. it has been such an honor having you guys here. So um, as we close, just if there's someone listening to this podcast and they're saying to themselves, man, I resonate with, um, you know, everything you said, like, I, I, I'm feeling this. What advice would you give them if they're either, you know, maybe coming out of one of those relationships or they're out and they're kind of tempted to go back in? What, what advice would you give them? I would say just what we talked about, separate, move yourself away. Now, it doesn't have to be out of malice. It doesn't have to be mean. It doesn't have to be into, um, antagonistic. Just get peace, get a peace away Spend at the very minimum two to three weeks in silence. Mm. And be careful of the friends that you've had, that you've shared in that relationship. Yeah. Because what happens is, is that sometimes the friends champion the relationship because they don't want to lose either one of mm -hmm. you. So you just have to kind of pull back and then begin to get clarity. Yeah. Is this what you want? Or... Make a list. I was judging. That <laughs> well, so that's my well, answer. Well, we work together. <laughs> like <should. this>. <laughs> Go ahead, honey. <laughs> Just make a list. Yeah. What happened during this process? What happened during this time? What hurt me? What did they do to hurt me? How did I feel afterwards? Documentation beats conversation mm -hmm. all day long. Go over this list. Mm -hmm. Will this change? What do I need to change in order for this not to happen? What do they need to change? And then begin to make some determinate, determining factors during that time. Um, I would say strongly you want to really, when it comes to divorce, you want to really think about it. Mm -hmm. Because that's very serious. But understand that you're not the bad guy for needing that to survive. Yeah. To survive. The only other thing I would add, I think, um, and this is going to sound controversial, and I'm just I'm gonna just say it, but sometimes you need to go back to realize that that joker wasn't no good to begin with. Like there are times where it's like, no, don't go back, girl, Molly, you in danger, girl, don't go back, right. like, don't, yes. like yes. don't do it. But honestly, sometimes you need to learn that fat meat is indeed greasy. Yes, and so when it comes down to it, it's like you know, before you get there, though, even though people don't listen we always challenge them is to give them an extended period of time to prove to you that they actually deserve you coming back to them. Yeah. Because, because sometimes relationships do work out again the second try. Like I, we're not going to, we are not champions or advocates of y'all just breaking up and leaving. Right. We do want healthy love. We do want healthy relationships. So yeah, if you're going to give them that opportunity to go back, do it, but do it in a controlled environment that a lot gives you the control that says, mm -hmm. I need to see, these are things, make another list. <laughs> these are the things I need to see mm -hmm. in order for this to work out this time around. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if it doesn't work out, at least you know, hey, I'm not crazy for walking away. Yes. I've given it my all one more mm -hmm. time. And you know what? All right, for real this time, you've proven to me that I don't belong here and you're not for me. Yeah. And, I, and just to add just a little bit more, I just want to say, this is for men as well as women. Because when we have conversations like this, sometimes we don't um, identify that men are, are welcome True. into this conversation. Yes, sir. And, and they truly are. Mm -hmm. and be, but because we are human and because we do have emotions, but we tend to hide and suppress them, and then we get treated mean. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm not You're mean right. to you. But, but <laughs> what ends up happening is that we begin to say, oh, I can endure this because that's what men are supposed to do. Yeah. No, you go do, you go through this just the same. 
Um, I think we endure so much more mental and emotional abuse than any, mm -hmm. than, than, I don't want to say so much more. There's no way to quantify that. But we do endure a lot of mental and emotional mm -hmm. abuse that we don't fess up to and we don't have to. So I just want to say that this conversation is open to both. Oh That's God, good. <laughs> All right. Come on, represent. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's this awesome. One. That's awesome. This is what I deal with. Every, I'm sorry. Every day. It's okay. So. That's awesome. So if someone's watching and they're like, how can I connect with these two? Because I love every bit of this. And I just believe that everyone who sees this is going to feel that way. So where can they connect with you guys? If they Ask want the to. Martins everywhere. Uh, AskTheMartins.com. Um, all of our socials are Ask the Martins. So anytime you want to look us up. Yeah. That's where we're, that's where we be. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, thank you again so much for, um, yes, yeah, just being here today. Like I said, this conversation, I could talk to y'all literally for hours. No, yeah, I, yeah, I love yeah. this. this. By so fast. <laughs> so yes. fast. I kept looking at the clock. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the way it happens. That's what happens. So thank you guys again. Thank you. All right, y'all, listen up. So I have some really, really exciting news for you guys. If you liked what you heard today, and of course I know you did, then I want you guys to join us on July 15th for Divorce Remix 2023. Now you may be saying, what is Divorce Remix? So Divorce Remix is a breakup recovery event that I put together in 2022, bringing it back in 2023. And guess what? The Martins are going to be our keynote speakers for 2023. So we're going to be talking about free to love, free to love yourself, free to love your life, free to love your journey. So getting rid of all that mess in your past so that you are free to love. So hop on over to divorceremix.com, pick up your tickets now before the price goes up so that you guys will be there on July 15th. So thank you again for listening to another episode of Divorce Remix, the podcast. I'll see you next time. Thank you.